Jen. Whoops. Uh, where's Jen? There's Jen. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Adam. That was wonderful. Very much looking forward to having a chat after the uh, final speaker of the afternoon. I have a feeling that Stephen's going to like this one. Stephen's going to see, you know, innovation is not dead. Uh, and progressive enhancement and beautiful design and innovation can coexist wonderfully together, as Jen is going to show us. I've known Jen for, for many years. I think we, we, we first met when we were both really sort of geeking out about HTML5 and we were seeing the potential um, for HTML5. So when Jen spots the potential in something, I tend to listen and pay attention to what she has to say. And uh, she's pretty excited about some of the new CSS stuff we've got to play with now. So let's hear what she has to say. Ladies and gentlemen, Jen Simmons. So um, I am incredibly excited. Here is the official timeline of the evolution of web page layout. We had the no layout layout for a while, then we switched to table-based layouts, then we switched to float-based layouts, which we're getting incredibly bored with. And next will be an amazing future of puppies riding unicorns. And I've been teaching people about the coming CSS and how we're going to be able to finally do page layout using CSS and not hacks with things like floats. And uh, people get very excited. They get all excited. And then they say, oh, but that's too bad. I can't use it because <laughs> IE. These days it's IE8. Sometimes it's IE6. It's always something with the word IE in it. I, the other day, I, uh, I was looking at some browser, some stats that we're going to talk about later and um, noticed that border radius is only 92% globally supported, while Flexbox is supported uh, 96%. So I tossed out the question, well, does that, you know, hey, people who think it's too early to use Flexbox, come on. And I got back people saying, uh, yes, it is too early to use Flexbox because clients still demand IE 8 and 9. Or it depends on your client's willingness to drop that percent, which could be significant, which is true. That percent is significant. Uh, someone else said it depends on how important that 4% is to your product. So I thought, why is it that people think this way? Why is there so much resistance? Why is this such a thing that just comes up over and over again? And I think it's because we always think of things in this binary. It either works or it doesn't work. Those are the choices. The thing works or it doesn't work. And we either use it or we don't use it. I can't control whether it works or not, but I can control whether I use it or I don't use it. So you put those together in this matrix, and here's our matrix of choices. Use uh, because it works, right? So this is what we want. Use it because it works. That's where the unicorn with the puppy riding on its back lives. That's what we want. And people say, well, I don't live in that world because I. <laughs> so uh, OK. Right, so we're stuck. So people say, well, I can't use this version. This doesn't work. You know, if I use it and it doesn't work, what happens? I get fired. Uh, and, or maybe you don't get fired. Maybe this happens. You're just covered in bugs. <laughs> Bug tickets coming back from QA, complaining about how things are broken and, you know, absorbed. People are complaining about budgets. Budgets are important. Thinking about how do we, like, deal with our budget, right? So this becomes the choice when you are thinking about things in this kind of a binary. Uh, it doesn't work, so I can't use it. Um, please stop telling me about new stuff. Uh, and I think the problem, though, is not IE. Internet Explorer is not the problem. The problem is that we think that this is the matrix of choices, that everything is a binary, when really it's more like this. It works and it doesn't work at the same time. And your choice is either to use it and not use it at the same time or to not use it at all. So I'm hoping to convince you that the unicorn with the puppy lives in the box where you use it and you don't use it, where it works and it doesn't work. And you can just let go of this idea that you have to wait five, 10 years, and meanwhile, you should just not use it at all. And why, here's this slide again, a picture of really boring websites. I mean, I feel like with the layout technology that's coming out, I want folks to use it sooner rather than later because it's going to give you a competitive advantage. It's going to make you be able to make websites that are more compelling, more usable by your users, your audience. And uh, you can get one up on your competition who are back in that world of thinking that they can't use it yet. Um, or this, right? Uh, 
I mean, the last the session earlier said this beautifully. Um, we are unique. Find out how unique. Look at our amazing website that is not unique to tell us all about our unique product. Um, always three columns. Our product is always described in three columns. We're bored. We're so bored. OK, so how does this work? How do you use something and not use something at the same time? What does that even mean? So there's this thing about CSS. Let's look at some. Uh, here I have a basic box with a background color, uh, you know, making it gray and a border wrapped around it. And then I'm using this thing called border radius. Background and border have been very well supported since IE4. This is not a new debate, right? When you had to support IE3, you were like, what do I do about IE3? I can't use, right? Okay, so that stuff we don't worry about so much anymore because it's been a long time since I've seen somebody who's supporting IE4. Uh, but border radius, when border radius came out, it was pretty controversial. It, you know, let's see about the support for border radius. Um, it doesn't work in IE8, right? It doesn't work in uh, upper mini. So, and, and let's look for a moment at can I use. I'm sure many of you use this website, but it actually has some features and superpowers that it took me years to figure out. For one, there's all these notes at the bottom where you can really dig in and you can look at the footnotes and you can see, and there are links to other resources all around the internet. They've been gathered in this one handy place. For you to do some research and find out when something is sort of in between what that means. You can also click and see all of the browsers and not just the most recent ones. Um, you know, going all the way back to Firefox 2, I can see what was going on there. If you hover over those boxes, there's all sorts of more additional information, and then I can click and see relative usage. Suddenly, IE8 doesn't look so important anymore, and you realize what we really need to be thinking about is Opera Mini. We aren't talking about Opera Mini, and we should be. And you think, well, what, what's the percent based on? Where are these stats coming from? Well, they're coming from Stat Counter, which is the data place that can I use uses. And uh, these numbers that I'm showing you today are based globally, so everyone in the world, but maybe your market isn't global. Maybe you're focused just on the UK. Well, you can open this up so it says settings, and you can plug in your country if you want to just focus on the stats coming from Stats Counter for the UK, if that's more appropriate for you. Or you can plug in your own Google Analytics. And you can see, ah, I'm working on this project. We have Google Analytics. It's been running for four years. Let's see who, what our audience needs. And you can get numbers that are better numbers for you. So I'm going to toss, toss out numbers today based on the global, the best, ver, the, you know, the best stats we have, which may or may not be correct. I mean, lots of times they're really not correct. Um, but those are the numbers I'm going to use today. But definitely feel free to go find numbers that are the closest to you, the most appropriate for you, and see what they are, because maybe it's very different. So what happens in IE8 when border radius is not supported? Let's, let's go find out. <laughs> oh, that's what people act, you act like, like, oh, the CSS property isn't supported in my browser. That's what happens to my users. Their computer explodes. <laughs> that's not what happens. That's not what happens at all. CSS has this amazing quality to it. It ignores the things it does not understand. It's very forgiving. It sees an error of any kind. Maybe you misspelled a word. It just goes, I don't know what that is. Moving on. So you can figure this out on your own. It's not that hard. What happens when we look at that code and we cross out the thing that's not going to get recognized by a browser? Well, this is what we get. We get a square box without the corners, right? It works and it doesn't work at the same time. You can use it and you cannot use it at the same time. There's no JavaScript involved. This code is not complicated. This is a very simple example, especially. This is how CSS works. There's a magic thing where weird stuff gets ignored. And we can use that to our advantage. So let's look at CSS shapes. This is one of my favorite new properties. I'm using it heavily on the WebAhead website, which is live right now, the webahead.net, the podcast that I do. Uh, every time there's a picture of a human, that picture is in a circle, and the text that is flowing around that circle is shaped in a circle. That's amazing. Well, how did that work? That worked because of um, this little code here. I put a width and a margin on the box. I float it left, which is required for shapes to get activated, and then I say shape outside circle. Uh, let's look at support. There's not a lot of support. It's, uh, now it's up to 58%. Last fall, it was at 50%. 
It might be a number different for you. For me, I would still use this if, my, if I had 8% support. I'd still totally use it. And just the other 92% people would, percent wouldn't be able to get it. Why? Because the fallback is really easy, right? Shape outside, circle. What happens when that's not there? You get a square. It didn't explode. Here's the same, same thing, but different example. Uh, grapes. I got some text using shape outside polygon that floats, that, that makes the text float around in this polygon shape, right? Same thing, cross it out, what do you get? You get a square. Works great. It works and it doesn't work both at the same time. These examples, by the way, are right now at labs.jensimmons.com. You can find them and links to the slides all right there. You can dig into them, dig into the code. It's on GitHub as well. Um, you can also follow me, Jen Simmons, on Twitter and I just tweeted a link to this and you can go dig into this stuff more later. But that's our first tool, CSS error handling. It ignores the stuff that it thinks is weird. So let's look at some more awesome technology that I'm super excited about and see what we can do with it. Here's an article, right, with a basic headline and we got a background on our headlines. Boring snooze, boring. But hey, you know, people know what this is. Look at this design. This is way more interesting. No matter what size the screen is or the viewport of the browser window, no matter what size that is, when this page loads, the, that background image for the header is gonna fill the viewport 100%. The headline is gonna be centered vertically as well as horizontally. And then the moment somebody starts scrolling, they're not confused because the article's right there, right below the line of scrolling. How did I do that? I used display flex on the header, which triggers this margin auto on the H1 to also um, center vertically. We've never had vertical alignment without crazy stuff that doesn't really work, uh, like JavaScript stuff, I mean. Um, now we can in CSS, this is gonna work. And then the other property I used was height 100 VH. So that says, hey, I want you header to be 100 viewport height units. It's CSS that gave us that. So what happens when we, um, don't have display flex or height 100 VH. Well, we get this. So the people who have support for it will have an experience that looks like this, and the people who don't have the, the, the support for it will, will get this experience. Well, we might say, you know, you might say, oh, you're the designer, and you think it looks cool, and uh, you show it to your client, and they're like, yeah, but the dirt is really important. We need to see more dirt. I don't like the way, right, it's not. Okay, all right, let's see what else we can do. We could add a height of, of 500 pixels and make that header taller. It's not gonna adjust depending on the size of the screen, but it is gonna give us a little bit more of that photo. And we're gonna say height 500 pixels first, and then we're gonna say height 100 VH. So what happens in the browsers where that do understand 100 VH? Well, they see two commands, height blah, 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 height blah, 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 blah. And it's like, you told me something twice, I'm gonna go with the second one because that's how CSS works. That's how the cascade works. If you, if something, if there's like a tie and two commands get set at, that are equally important, then the last one gets listened to. So that code's gonna work in both situations. But let's think about this a little bit more because there are, we are using two properties and there's a chance that we have some browsers that support viewport height but do not support Flexbox like IE9. So what's gonna happen in that situation? I have to sit here at my desk and think about it. Um, so if we don't have flex and we do have 100 VH, this is the result that we get. So the picture is 100 viewport units high, but the headline is not in the middle, it sticks to the top. Okay, well maybe I think this looks great and I'm done. Look at all the dirt, it's great. Oh, but you know the client, they're still not happy, so um, they wanna have a little bit more space at the top, they want the headline to come down a little bit. Okay, well we, we could use margin for that. Oh, margin's not gonna work because maybe it's getting collapsed or maybe it, uh, margin auto is overriding the margin top command. So, okay, that's not gonna work. Let me see, we could, oh, let's put some padding on it. We'll put some padding 2M on the top. Oh, let's put it on the bottom as well so that that's not gonna jack up our vertical centering. And uh, when I look at it in the browsers that support everything, this is what I get. When I look at it in the browsers that don't support, the only, the IE9, this is what you're gonna get. Um, and this is the final code. This little bit of code, which is longer than the code I had before. And for any of you who think, oh, that's too, it's way more complicated to explain this, honestly, than it is to do it. Uh, some of you might be thinking, well, but I can't do that in Photoshop. I don't wanna draw that in Sketch. How many screens am I supposed to draw in Sketch for every, no. 
No. This is why I love designing in the browser. Because you have an original idea that maybe you figured out in, in Sketch or in Photoshop and how ideally you want it to look and you figured out the graphics and the styling and the branding and everything. And then you go and you put a prototype into a browser and you try this out and you mess with the code until you figure out exactly how it's going to work. Um, and I didn't open Internet Explorer 7 or 8 or 9. I hate running virtual machines on my laptop. I did all this and all those screenshots were Firefox Nightly. I just go into the little uh, web inspector and I turn things on and off. I don't have this memorized what's going to happen. I just check the box, uncheck the box, check the other box. What happens in this combination? What happens in that combination? CSS overrides. So this is our second tool that we're going to be able to use to get the CSS we want, even though things are new. Um, again, this is just how CSS works. So let's look at some more yummy tech, some yummy uh, new stuff. Initial letter, I love it. Drop caps have been next to impossible. Uh, we end up seeing a lot of stuff where like, there's space where there shouldn't be space. Um, there's a new CSS property that's coming. We're going to be able to do this. So here we've got two things going on. We've got one, we're going to uh, use a pseudo selector to, do, to isolate the first letter. So we don't have to wrap that in a span. Then we're going to change the color and make it bold and put a little bit of margin on it. And then we're going to say initial letter four, which means I want you to make the letter the height of four lines of text. And then if we change the font, or we change the line spacing, or the user makes the font bigger, or the font doesn't download, it doesn't matter, because the letter is always going to be the height of four lines of text. You don't have to do any of the rest of the work. This is awesome. All right, so how's support going? First letter is very well supported, except for, you know, up there in the corner. But I just taught you how to deal with that, so you can go figure that out. How about initial letter? How well supported is it? Oh, it's so new, it's not even on Can I Use yet. Uh, but I happen to know it's in Safari 9. There's lots of other places where there's information about things besides can I use. Every browser maker has their own uh, website that has like new stuff that's coming out. There's lots of information. So I learned about this from Apple. Um, it's in Safari 9, which is about 12% on those global stats. Um, so awesome. Here we are in Safari. Totally works. It looks great. So let's, you know, what happens when those two commands don't work? Oh, yeah, right, because the color and the margin and the bold do get applied, and the initial letter doesn't get applied. So you end up with this little tiny L that's very light, and you can't, oh, that's, that's bad. So what are we going to do about this? For 88% of the population would see this. So um, this is what we can do. There's this thing called feature queries. They're similar to media queries in a funny way, where you write at supports, and then you write an if statement. So hey, if initial letter is supported, or if WebKit initial letter is supported, because there's a prefix going on, then I want you to do all the stuff inside this bracket. If the answer is false, I want you to skip all of this. Really powerful. Tool number three, feature queries. Ah, but it's sort of new, so how much support is there for at support? Yeah, it's not 100%. Doesn't work in any version of IE. By the way, Aaron, please put it in IE 11. <laughs> uh, it's not in uh, Opera Mini. It's not in a lot of the phones. Maybe it's not in the console browsers. Like, so what are we going to do? Well, you know what happens? If someone, a browser, doesn't understand at supports, it basically returns a no as its answer. And it skips over that entire block. It doesn't just skip the at support syntax. It skips everything that's inside of there. Um, so this is it, Windows 7 on Windows Vista. I actually went ahead and said, hey, make all the text red. And you can see that the text is not red because uh, IE 7 is ignoring everything inside the at support. So in a way, the trick of it is that if the browser doesn't know what at supports means, it's basically, basically going to lie and tell you the answer is no to this question. And the only time that it's a problem is if there's a feature that is supported in a browser, but at supports is not. And so it's telling you no when the answer should be yes. Um, but there's a, and I've, I've encountered this in very specific, very strange ed cases. Um, but you can do at supports not. So you can reverse your question. You sort of ask the other question. And you can sit there and use, you know, logic to figure out, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I want to write it like this, but, okay, well, if I write it in a slightly more complicated way, I'm going to be good. Um, so I think this is going to be incredibly important, and we're going to be using this quite a lot. Um, uh, auto prefixer is cool, use it if you know what it is. Uh, modernizer um, is another tool. This is the one that I hear people talk about a lot when we say, what are we going to do about full page layout and lack of support for things like grid? 
Um, people say, oh, we'll use Modernizer. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's a little plugin that you can get, a library, JavaScript, and you just add a little bit of JavaScript to your page, and the JavaScript runs, and it sees whether or not that property is supported. And if it is supported, then it's gonna add a class to your HTML element of, uh, like in this example, CSS gradients. And if it's not supported, then it adds a class to the HTML element of no dash grad CSS gradients. And um, in some ways this is cool because it makes life very simple as a person writing the code where you can just kind of organize your CSS in this very clean way and clean is satisfying. Um, you can just have here, oh, if you've got FlexRock, then run this code and if you don't have FlexRock, run this code. Um, but my problem with this is JavaScript. It depends on JavaScript downloading, running, and then your layout being started. And it's a race, and CSS always wins that race. If you have two websites and one needs JavaScript to finish running before the, web, the layout starts running, and the other website, the layout just runs, the CSS just runs, this website will win every single time. I don't want JavaScript involved. If I have to get Modernizer out, I'll get it out. I think it's a good tool, it should be in our toolbox, but it's, it's, not, a, it's not the best tool we have, and I'm gonna avoid it as much as I possibly can. Uh, so we got, the other tool, we got another tool, conditional style sheets. Um, we could call this tool zero instead of tool number five. You remember this tool? Uh, you can like load certain style sheets just for older versions of Internet Explorer or put classes in your HTML element just for certain versions of Internet Explorer. It works in IE 6, 7, 8, and 9. It doesn't work in IE 9, 10 and 11, but there's this hack, back to the hacks, there's this hack where you can use uh, at media high, MS high contrast none and MS high contrast active to sort of isolate IE 10 and 11 if you need to like write CSS just for those browsers. Um, or we could use a polyfill. Now I'm totally out of time and I got seven more minutes of stuff to say. I don't know if I should keep going or if I should go for it. Um, so polyfill, right? So polyfill is when you basically you get a JavaScript library that's been custom written to activate a certain CSS property and uh, you know, oh, you don't have CSS grid layout? Well, we're gonna have a polyfill for CSS grid layout. I, I don't know, and I'll show you in a minute why. I, I don't know that that's a good right idea, but. Uh, so let me show you grid, just very quickly. Um, here's a web page, right? We got a bunch of pictures. This is very classic, we're used to this, we're totally bored with this. All the pictures are exactly the same size as each other. They're all the exact same aspect ratio. It's beautiful layout, I love this. I, you know, I know most of the people at this company. I think it's one of my favorite development shops. But what happens when your pictures are like different sizes and shapes? Um, so here I've got an example where I've applied visual styling, but I haven't done any layout for the photos themselves. And you can see those photos. Some of them are tall, some of them are thin, some of them are short. I force them to all be the same width, but you can see the heights are very varied. So what do we do old school, like it's 2005? We apply floats, and this is what happens. You get this float drop problem where um, like that's number one, number two, number three, number four, and then number five ends up here because it gets like stuck, like you get stuck under the corner of the sink or something and you snag your clothes. And then number six is here because it got stuck, right? This is why we've made everything a square for the last decade is because of this problem, right? It's not because squares are better, it's because float drops are annoying. So let's look at some other possibilities. Um, Oh yeah, there's, there's squares, right? You get that. Um, Flexbox columns. This is just a random possibility using Flexbox instead. Basically what's happening is I'm saying, hey, lay out a row of photos, make them all the same height, make them whatever width they wanna be, and when you run out of space, start another row, and when you run out of space, start another row, and some of the photos are really wide and some are really narrow. Flexbox. Or I can use Flexbox in the other direction where I've said, I want all of you to be the same width, but you can be whatever height you wanna be. And I uh, cap the height of the page, which means you sideways scroll. Like, good idea, bad idea, I don't know. We could debate about that later. Um, but again, you've got like this completely different way to lay out photos. No JavaScript involved. This is Flexbox. Flexbox works because you're doing in one direction. Maybe it's one direction like a coil, but you're basically laying things out in one direction. If you stretched it out to an infinitely long canvas or infinitely tall canvas, it would be one line. Grid is for two-dimensional stuff. So here's a layout using Grid, also running in Firefox Nightly, because um, Grid works in Firefox Nightly right now. Um, 
And I can say, I went with squares, and then I could say, but this, this photo, I want you to take up two rows, and this photo, I want you to take up two columns, cell, two cells column-wise, and this one, I want you to take up two in both directions. So you can make certain images bigger than other images. Here's the code for that. Um, there's some really interesting innovations about to come. Again, all these examples are at labs.gensemics.com. You can dig into them further on your own. But when can we start using grid? When are we going to get to use, especially when are we going to get to use grid for the entire page layout? Right now, it's not supported in any browsers whatsoever, um, except older versions of Internet Explorer. Well, no, not old versions, but IE 10, 11, Edge 12, 13 have an old version of the grid specification. It's the, the specification has changed very radically, so I just sort of pretend that that olive green isn't there. And basically, it's just red all the way across. But all four browser makers are working on this very hard right now, and I think it's going to Unlike Flexbox, it's going to drop fully baked and in all of our browsers within the same months or years, of, like in one year, inside of one year. Um, and we're going to want to start using it right away because it's going to be completely awesome. So how are we going to do this? Uh, these are our tools. Again, remember the fact that CSS ignores code that it doesn't recognize. Um, the CSS cascade, feature queries, modernizer if we need to, conditional style sheets for IE, uh, and polyfills if we have to. Um, so what are we going to do about page, full page layout, right? You're going to be able to use grid on little small bits inside your code with, you know, some easy fallbacks. But what, we, what, what if you want to do the entire page using grid? So a lot of people are going to say, well, you can't use grid until 100% of your audience has it. 98% is not good enough. We have to wait for 100%. Um, but again, I think that's a real shame. I think it's missed opportunities, and I think your competition is going to eat you for lunch in the meanwhile because they're not going to do this. You could write float-based or inline block or display table-based layouts and deliver that to some browsers while the rest of everybody gets a grid-based layout. You should not be jacking up your HTML to change, like you shouldn't change your HTML for your layout anyway for accessibility reasons and all kinds of reasons. So you're going to have, this HTML is going to be the same, all you need to do is deliver different CSS to different situations, and I just showed you how to do that. So you are going to be able to do that, and you can have then sort of your, the layout you use today, take your 2015 layout and put it into a place that only certain browsers see, and then write new layout for the browsers that can see it. Um, another option is to deliver, and we've done this a lot with the responsive design, sort of towards the end of figuring out how to do responsive design, more and more people would say, hey, let's just deliver sort of a, a simplified layout, a skinny layout, a mobile layout to uh, the browsers that don't understand grid, and we'll do a full page grid, crazy complex grid layout for the ones that do. And we see, I mean, here's the New York Times, there's an opinion page on the New York Times website, um, right, there's the layout, and then there's uh, the, it's, if you go to the mobile site, you know, sometimes I'm on Twitter or on my computer and someone has a link that they dropped into Twitter from their phone and it shows up, and I see sometimes I actually like the mobile site design better. Um, because it's simpler, this, uh, come on, this, right? Like, so, so certain browsers might see a simpler version. Um, and then polyfills, again, about polyfills, like, I've not really seen a polyfill for grid that works, especially, and I don't really want to. Um, why? Because, like, here's an example of a website that has kind of a innovative, like, someone was talking about it, and I was like, let me check out this innovative, amazing layout. This could be interesting. And uh, it's a little hard to tell from watching someone else's video, but I'm trying my best to scroll very, very evenly. And meanwhile, the page is like way behind, and then it hurries to catch up, and way behind, and it hurries to catch up. I can't even, I can't enjoy this innovative layout because the JavaScript is, right? Or this same thing. These people, it takes so long to load this page that this website actually built its own custom loading bar on the top of the web page. And this is on a really fast internet connection with a really powerful computer. I can't even imagine on the rest of it, right? Like, it's just stuttery, stuttery. And this is why the whole industry starts obsessing about 60 frames per second. And, oh, we need, fix, we need 60, frames, 60 frames per second. We'll solve this problem. You know what else will solve this problem? Not using JavaScript for layout. <laughs> use JavaScript for all the other cool stuff that it does. Do not use JavaScript for layout. Just no. No polyfill for No. No. No grid if you don't have polyfill, if you don't have it. So this is what I think we're going to do. We're going to do a basic layout that doesn't require grid or media queries or feature queries. We're going to, I hope we go back to handwriting your own CSS for this. 
don't use bootstrap anymore, don't use foundation, don't come to me and go, how do I use 960GS plus grid? You don't, just, just, if you don't know how to float something and you're a professional front-end developer, go learn how to do a float-based layout, start now. <laughs> you got some time, it's a good homework for the next couple of months, go learn how to use floats. Uh, keep it simple, do, get it done. And then layer on top of that code that uses grid layout and we can use feature queries to hide it from non-supporting browsers. I really don't think we're gonna have any browsers that support grid and don't support feature queries. I don't see that coming. So probably anyone who gets grid is also gonna get feature queries and we can structure our code. And you know what you get when we do it like this? We get a pony riding a unicorn. Thanks. Yeah.